it has to meet a person personality who is closely associated with the Syriac scholarship. Within the Syriac scholarship, he has specialized in the Syriac language and the writings of the early church fathers. And uh, he is very passionate about reading on St. Philoxenus of Marburg and St. Uh, Jacob of Serug. However, he does not limit himself by reading these two fathers, but a whole lot of Syriac fathers and literatures. Most of the fathers that he has come across from Syriac tradition, he has taken a very deep interest in researching and also pub publishing those literatures. One of the interesting notes that I must emphasize about his scholar scholarship is that his interest was completely switched to the Syriac language, though he hails from a different uh, Christian ecclesial uh, association, that is his Protestant Christian tradition. Yet he has put his whole interest in studying the Syriac fathers and bringing out their world to the present theological academia. And you must be eager to know about that scholar, I know, aren't you? Do you have any guess? I do not want to test your patience anymore. Today, we are blessed to have Reverend Dr. Robert Ekichen, a world famous Syriac Orthodox scholar who has written enormous books on and articles on Syria tradition and Syria literature. Welcome, Reverend Doc Dr. Robert Kitchen, and nice Thank to you. meet you. Good to be with you and, and with you. everyone else as well. Thank you so much. And I'm so glad and also I'm grateful to God that I have contacted uh, you probably a couple of years ago when I started my research in Syriac yeah. studies. And you helped me so much. And we only had email contacts and, uh, oh, I mean, uh, we had uh, telephonic conversations. But today, we are so glad that we could meet together. Yes, and you. thank you. Thank you for accepting our invitation, the invitation of Oroho, the Way family. And once again, on uh, on behalf of the entire crew of uh, Oroho, the, uh, the Way, I welcome you this uh, great time of conversation. Thank you very much. Uh, it's something looking forward to, that's for sure. Thank you. Probably we, we start with uh, some of uh, some of your own personal experiences uh, about the Syriac studies. And let me just directly ask you one question. What mm -hmm. made, as a minister of Knox Metropolitan United Church, get into Syriac studies? Yeah, that's a, that is a question I've been asked by a lot of my friends and, uh, and uh, parishioners through the years. Um, when I was in seminary, um, which was at Pacific School of Religion in Berkeley, California, um, my wife and I, my wife's also a minister, and we were in seminary together, we were fans uh, of Thomas Merton, the Trappist monk, who had written a tremendous amount regarding uh, spiritual life and prayer life. And we read just about everything that he had available at the time. He had tragically died a few years before. Um, okay. And one of the books was called The Way of the Fathers. And it was a collection of his translations of some of the Desert Father stories. Okay. He translated from Latin. Okay. And in his introduction, he said, well, Latin is all I can do. He says, but originally it was in Coptic in Syriac, Armenian, Ethiopian, and so forth. A few months later, that, that somehow stuck in my mind, and a few months later, uh, our the Graduate Theological Union uh, was sponsoring a, um, a year-long course uh, beginning Syriac. And so I thought, oh, well, that should be, that should be quite good. I had taken some Hebrew, okay. and I did. And uh, well, it never stopped from there. So, um, and uh, I just, it caught me uh, 
uh, as something exciting, as something of a great deal of, of depth uh, in terms of spirituality. Um, and so I, yeah, I went to Catholic University uh, in, in, in my first churches uh, back in Maryland and Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C. And, um, and then for many years just would do a paper or so every year at a conference and then finally returned uh, to graduate school in my, uh, I guess, late middle age. <laughs> and in order to, uh, I went to Oxford uh, and studied under Sebastian Brock. And, um, but then returned right back into the parish ministry. Oh, okay. And I served uh, right after I finished at Oxford. I came to Regina, Saskatchewan, mm -hmm. and uh, served in the United Church of Canada, the, uh, uh, the Snox Metropolitan uh, Church uh, in Regina, and stayed there 18 years. And then we, my wife and I both retired uh, four years ago. And that, oh. it's been a, a wonderfully busy time, uh, <laughs> full of Syriac, I must say. <laughs> okay. With this entire uh, passion in terms of uh, the Syriac life and Syriac language and the literature and Syriac fathers, what do you think Syriac Christianity that could offer us, uh, that could offer us the world today, uh, particularly from your experience? Yeah, it's it's um, it it offers a, a tremendous amount, and I I still I tell the even though I remain a uh, uh, a very low church Protestant, um, I have told many of my colleagues and uh, students uh, who are uh, Orthodox that uh, you know Syriac really is one of the well to use our. The, the common expression, it is truly the hidden pearl, uh, a real gem for uh, for Christianity in general. The the strength of Syriac, I think, is in its, uh, among, among one of the major things, is in its um, study of the scriptures and analysis of the scriptures. Um, it's very imaginative, very okay. creative. And, and in, indeed, it's not just, as we sometimes find in some circles, it's not just a, an explanation, you know, of what Scripture's about, what Jesus is saying, or, you know, another biblical figure, um, and what it means. But it is, in fact, drawing the reader uh, into the text to be part of that that biblical story, biblical uh, account. So you are participating and being, you know, part of it in the way that, particularly with um, the early church, uh, early Syriac writers and fathers did. Uh, Jacob of Sarug is particularly uh, wonderful uh, at doing this, but so is Philoxenus, the Book of Steps, Afrahat, Ephraim, of course, and, and a number of others. But that's very fascinating that you you have found a very different approach to the Syriac literature and also the way the Syriac fathers have dealt with the Bible uh, and their uh, interpretations. So most of us, especially in this modern age, when we deal with the, uh, the young world uh, of our Syriac Christianity and also the members of the church in general, they do have a question uh, even today whether the the language makes any uh, any difference in our church life, or uh, especially for the youngsters. So they are more into the modern languages and especially with the English uh, language, and they are with that. And it, it's of course they they have to communicate in the English language. However, in terms of their religious expressions and 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 also for looking forward to their religious uh, religious uh, uh, you know life do you mm -hmm. think that Syriac Christianity and Syriac language is is a component that they could take on uh, in their life I, I I do think so well it it, it in fact um, language itself I'm 
there's a number of people who have written about language and, and its role in culture. Um, and that is that Syriac, and one of the beauties of Syriac is that uh, it expresses things that, yeah, we translate them and we translate the text into English, but we always lose something. And Syriac, uh, the way it expresses things, uh, gives us uh, an, a doorway into uh, a very live and vibrant culture. Um, now, it is difficult for, um, for younger people uh, who do, do, are growing up in, say, the Western world. We spent uh, time teaching in, um, in Södertälje in Sweden, where there are many um, uh, Syriac Christian immigrants. And indeed, the, uh, the young people, uh, you know, really grow up. It, it's a question of what is their first language? Is it the language at home? I guess that would be the case, um, whether it be Turioyo or, or, um, um, or Arabic with the general cases. But then they, of course, would be learning Swedish right off the bat. And then uh, also... Um, uh, and then English was, was definitely a, a strong second language in Swedish schools. So Syriac loses out sometimes, you know, in that. And I think that would be the case in the modern, uh, um, you know, in the U.S. and Canada and Australia and England. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's a problem that I think we just have to try to, help them get excited about the subject matter and um, and what it the world that it opens up and and that the language can really be an exciting and uh, intriguing um, you know vehicle for for learning more that that's an exciting uh, way of expression and and it, I'm, I'm pretty sure that the youngsters en would get encouraged with your words, and uh, uh, especially who you who are uh, into this language and uh, and uh, taken into a different shape of understanding uh, the not only the language but the literature behind the whole language, and and, and also as you were mentioning about many names of, of the early Syriac fathers, and in connection to these two co uh, two comments that you made, uh, mm -hmm. I just to know that uh, you you are you are producing so many uh, literatures with regard to fathers recently and you have worked uh, on a on a number of translation of memory of said uh, jacob of seruk and yeah. is it is it this uh, is this part of your larger project or it's only a, a, a part of your early project it's <laughs> it's something that happened along the way <laughs> i think it's oh, but, yeah. but i uh, it, I can't remember how and when I first uh, worked on Jacob. Well, I do remember. I do remember this. Um, when I was at Oxford, uh, I was invited by one of my um, fellow graduate students, um, Manolis Papoutsakis, uh, originally from Greece, and he said, "Hey, we're we're doing a reading course with." Um, with Sebastian Brock or a reading class where we were just going to be reading a specific text. And the other two people in the, uh, in the, our group were Aho uh, Shimun Kasho, who now is the director of the uh, Master of Arts in Syriac Theology at uh, the University of Salzburg in Austria. And uh, at that time, Adip Aydin, who's now more Polycarpus, who's the, the Archbishop of the Netherlands. So we were all together there reading, and what we were reading was the um, uh, the Memra of uh, Jacob of Sarug on Jonah. Oh, okay. <laughs> and I'm uh, uh, hopefully within this year, I'm going to finally uh, publish it. I've uh, gone through several oh. drafts. It is Jacob's longest poem. Okay. It's 123 pages. <laughs> starts okay. and it starts from chapter one, verse one, in, in the canonical book, in 
mm -hmm. all the way through. You know, along the way, a lot of, um, you know, references to Christ, how the different actions of the people in the story, you know, sort of um, are, are imitating or, or uh, leading, you know, they're, they're sort of previewing what's going to happen with Christ. And anyway, after doing that, or doing, we didn't read through the whole thing. Um, I uh, that that caught my attention and and, and interest. So I've, I've done a few others, um, uh, particularly for the Syriac Orthodox Patriarchal Journal. Uh, Father Roger uh, Akras is a, is a close uh, friend. We were both at uh, the Hill Museum and Manuscript Library for for uh, three months together and do a lot of things. So he invited me to do that and it's been gracious in his correcting my uh, my English along the way. So, yeah. so that's it. I mean, the, I intend to be doing a few more, but I don't have a particular, um, you know, project uh, in, involved because yeah, there's a, there's a lot of Jacob that has not been uh, translated yet. That's very exciting. I, I'm pretty sure this project will give a, a very good scholarship, uh, not only to the Syria Christianity, but the entire uh, theological zonry, uh, oh. and also biblical studies. Uh, I think the Old Testament studies also would get benefit out of this. And more, more excited thing is that you, you are continuing your association with the church and also with... Uh, uh, Abuna uh, Roger Akras and uh, Syria yeah. Orthodox mm -hmm. and it's it's, uh, it's uh, academic uh, interest. So I, I'm so excited to 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 know that project and also looking forward to read that that particular. Well, it's 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 it, the problem is it is so long that it takes quite a while to revise. So oh, yeah. and then and then you keep doing it. But at any rate, it's it. it uh, but there's a lot of, I mean, what I really, uh, what I have tended to look at in Jacob um, are the, um, the memory that are focused upon, you know, some of my favorite biblical stories. <laughs> okay. And so that's, that's what's drawn me in. How is he going to deal with these? How is he going to turn, I mean, Jacob is, is best known for, you know, everything points to Christ. Yeah, I know. So, uh, so in fact, when I have taught um, at uh, Salzburg, I, uh, I've i told this, I teach New Testament exegesis, Syriac uh, New Testament exegesis. And so in the class, I we look at a number of authors and how they deal with the New Testament. But I give them parts of Jacob's homily on uh, Jonah. Oh, okay. They say, I hope we're doing the New Testament. And I said, you read a little bit of this and you're going to wonder which is which now. <laughs> you know, the, uh, for Jacob and for many of the early Syriac writers, uh, there really was no distinction between Old and New Testament. You, know, you were mm -hmm. dealing with the scriptures. And one of them you know, the, the different, uh, uh, whether we think of what we think of as New Testament and Old Testament, they feed upon one another. They refer to one another uh, quite heavily. And um, so that, uh, yeah, Jonah is a Christian, uh, is a Christian text. And, and a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, biblical scholars today would say the same thing. At least it, it's a Jewish text, yes. Uh, in the first place, but it is also, um, it has become a vehicle for us to be able to uh, understand the, uh, the Christian story as well. Yep. Yeah. Thank you for sharing this great journey of uh, learning with Jacob Seru. And I think uh, as, a, as a research student, when I started my research, I mm -hmm. came to know you through discourses, definitely. Oh, yeah. That to come to you and to find more resources. And therefore, I think I should now put, uh, just uh, keep some specific questions with regard to your interest in uh, 
in terms of flexiness of Mahabhub. The reason is, again, to most individuals outside the Syriac tradition, especially outside academia, they are known to Morafrat, uh, probably center frame in the Syria, uh, center frame the Syrian Isaac of Nineveh, and and many others. But uh, Felixenos of Marburg was was known to everyone, but it was not that uh, that much as we think about center frame or, or Morafrat at that point in time. Yeah. That's the time you you brought up with a new scholarship in the in the whole area of Felixenos of Marburg. What made you to 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 move towards uh, Felixenos of Marburg and this course? Yeah, well I, I have found throughout, I think, my life in general <laughs> and so forth, and particularly in these things that uh, you don't plan, um, you know, to to find these people. They find you. Um, <laughs> and so the, the phylloxenus, I, I really can't specifically remember. Uh, when I was at Catholic University, um, my uh, professor was uh, Father Alexander Delella. And he, um, uh, in my second year there, he was introducing me to, um, you know, in a reading course, a number of different Syriac authors. And we'd read a few pages of them and, and so forth, or a, a, um, a memra or something like that. So that's how I was introduced to the Book of Steps. And it was also with Philoxenus um, and a few others as well. Uh, and I quickly found, or somewhere along the line, found out that, uh, realized that Philoxenus and, um, and the Book of Steps had a, a connection between the two, um, which uh, hardly anybody else had ever noticed. I, I eventually did find one person who made a, like a one sentence reference to it. And that was is that they both, uh, referred to the communities that they were speaking to had uh, a structure of two levels of the upright or the kine and we who were basically lay people um, uh, and then the the gemire or the perfect who were in, in in the book of steps the perfect were uh, this was before monasticism but they um, but they indeed uh, uh, they were celibate uh, they did not own any property um, they taught they lived life of prayer they did not work there's a reason for that but this, we'll save that for later um, and uh, so the, the two authors dealt with these two groups. It was obviously the, there was this structure that was common between them. However, I could notice that uh, Philoxenus, who was later than the Book of Steps, um, dealt with them a little bit differently. In other words, they had many of the same characteristics that he would describe them, but then many were, were different um, or or heading in a slightly different direction. So I did a, uh, I did a master's um, thesis on this, and then that just kept me interested in Philoxenus for quite some time. And indeed, when I, 20 years later, uh, when I finished uh, my uh, doctoral dissertation, it was on the same subject. <laughs> okay. Except that it was, if the, the the work was something like four times as large, you know, right. and, and expanded it in many different ways, and had learned quite a bit more about the okay. distinction between the two, and so that that's how I got started with Philoxenus, and um, you know, and so I've I've kept up uh, interest in in him. I have read a, a handful of his other works. He is interestingly the fact that yeah, the, the people don't know of the name. Um, he is, uh, I think the consensus is now is that he has written the most hmm. of, any, of any Syriac author, more than African, more than uh, uh, Bar even Barabroyo, um, mm -hmm. uh, so that uh, he has a tremendous amount of uh, um, of literature, uh, a lot of smaller things that we have not yet 
uh, you're not yet translated. Um, yeah. yeah. With specific attention to discourses, and I know this is a text which which deals with our our life. And uh, how how do you think, or what what is there to offer? What's there to offer to the world? What do you think that Christians, all with all traditions, could learn from uh, mm -hmm. reading the work of Mo Felixinos with with specific uh, attention to uh, his discourses? Well, he is. Yeah, there, there's a tremendous amount. Um, it is a, as as you well know, it's a, it's a, it's again a very long book. It's a collection of thirteen homilies. We can call them. Yeah. Um, that he apparently directed towards uh, the monks in the monasteries under his Episcopal care. And um, there's still a debate as to whether he actually sit, you know, got up there physically and delivered them and someone wrote them down or he had written them down ahead of time or whether he wrote them um, and then sent them around to the different monasteries. Uh, it's something that myself and some others are, are working on trying to, I don't think there's a final answer to that. But the homilies are fairly long and they are, they are about the spiritual life. Yet he hardly at all deals with the Christological issues that he's perhaps better known for. Um, and also got him into trouble. Um, and uh, so it's about the spiritual life. So he starts off with faith. And then he, ha uh, he has two homilies on faith, two homilies on uh, simplicity, mm -hmm. two on the fear of God, two of them on renunciation of the world. And then the last two are... Um, this gets is where it gets even more complicated uh, historically. Uh, we uh, we're pretty sure that it's because he was heavily influenced by a Greek um, uh, theologian, Evagrius of Ponticus, um, mm. who uh, whose works were translated very quickly into Syriac, and um, so. Uh, the last two sets of homilies are on uh, gluttony, the lust of the belly, mm -hmm. and and fornication. Yes, and those are the first two. Uh, Evagrius is best known in our uh, Christian history, um, as he came up with the idea that there are seven thoughts, ideas that keep sort of, you know, coming up and attacking your mind, you know, periodically, and. Um, and these are the become in medieval Christianity the eight deadly sins, and the very first two are gluttony and fornication, which are exciting topics. So forth. <laughs> I, I understand. Yeah, and, and um, so it's but so what you're dealing with is he as you read through the homilies, and this is why I do feel that he he knows if he was not delivering them directly to the students, to the, to the monks. He understands their situations. He understands their doubts about the spiritual life. And in many ways, this, this is very transferable for lay people today because yeah. his main prob the main problem that he finds in front of him is that here are a, a, a number of these, um, we'll, we'll call them younger, monks they were new monks into the monastery and um and they were still not sure whether they had made the right decision he talks about that uh, they start thinking about their mind one of the, th the thoughts that come back to them are you know i left my wife behind i left my family behind i had all this i had money i had property um, I had a house, um, you know, gee, I could go back into the world and do, do a lot of good for, as a Christian, you know, or like that. But he's saying, you know, in the long run, you know, the, the best way is to renounce the world um, and, uh, and indeed follow in this, uh, 
in this uh, you know way that lets gets rid of those um, those things that hold us down. Um, and I think that's something that you know lay people as well. You know we're struggling with um, you know why should I be a Christian? Yeah. I live in this this way of life, which requires some, um, you know, sacrifice, some abstinence, um, you know, from other kinds of things in the world uh, in order to be faithful to God and to be able to help other people. And it's um, and so I think, you know, what he's talking about can uh, he's talking to monks. Yes. But he's, uh, but he's talking to people who are really just out of the. Uh, they're they're as he use, uses an expression I think at one point that uh, their feet they're standing in the monastery but their head their mind <laughs> is back in the world. Okay, and that's and that's what they I, have. I think I think that is a very very relevant. Uh, uh, relevant book that you have translated to the to the world. The reason is, uh, as you said, uh, even in today's uh, generation, or maybe we, the world, is still uh, going through the similar kind of situation. So, I think you have you have just given the the nutshell of the of the book. I think people, the, the, the listeners, should grab one one of the one one one, one copy of. Uh, of uh, discourses and they should enjoy reading the uh, the entire entire text so that they will know more about what you said and also which will definitely direct them towards the right perspective of uh, of a christian way of life and i think that in that way it is it's a very relevant uh, explanation that you have given to our audience and i think one of the questions that i should have asked you uh, prior to this because you when you said about the connection between uh, the discourses and the book of steps, I had another question. You you also translated the book of steps, another fantastic work of uh, Suryak spirituality. And therefore, uh, do you find or do you think uh, more Philoxenos was uh, influenced by this work? Um, I get it's one of those questions that we don't have a full answer to. Uh, I think the answer is both yes and no. Yes, in a certain way, no, in another. Um, as far as I can tell, uh, and I've read through the Book of Steps and Philoxenus, you know, countless times uh, in preparing the translations, Philoxenus never uh, quotes the Book of Steps directly. He uses similar ideas about the, the upright and the perfect, but he does not uh, actually quoted. He never mentions the book. Hardly anybody ever does. That's one of the problems with the Book of Step. Um, and so, but what we assume happened uh, is that this institution, if you will, the structure of the upright and the perfect, the kine and the gemire, um, continued to be part of um, various churches. Uh, Syriac churches uh, for centuries. Sometimes it's written about, sometimes it's not. Um, the group that picks it up and does the most with it uh, in later years is actually the Church of the East. Uh, there's a lot of writings, and since the uh, Book of Steps, as far as we know, was was written um, in Sasanian Persia, so in, in Iraq, um, in probably sometime in the fourth century, um, you know, it never it never left that area. Everybody, you know, people would continue around about it. So I think Philoxenus was influenced by um, uh, not by the Book of Steps directly, but by how it was um, it was continued in other churches. The problem with the Book of Steps is that. We, the Book of Steps is, again, a, a, a series of, we can call them homilies. Uh, there are all different kinds of genre in them. Um, written by what appears to be one person who was the spiritual leader of this uh, community 
um, looks like on the outskirts of a, of a village or a, or a city even. And um, he's, uh, you know, this author is, um, you know, writing about how he is organizing uh, the upright and the perfect. And then later he talks about how uh, the perfect are, are, are not very perfect. <laughs> And, and then he later finds out, as towards the end of it, he, he kind of looks around and he says, hey, the upright who are supposed to be serving the perfect, who are supposed to be serving the needs of average people um, you know, in the community with food and shelter and you know, uh, medicine and all that. He realizes that the, the, the upright are actually pretty darn good Christians. Yeah. And they're, they're, they're married, many of them. So he says, okay. you know, you're almost there. <laughs> uh, but um, uh, if all you do, all you can, if all you have to do is give up your wife, <laughs> you can be, a, you can be perfect. Um, but then when the, the, there is no real time schedule in the book, uh, when the last homily finishes, we hear nothing more. We never find out who the man is. We never find out where it was precisely. We have very few cases of, um, you know, anybody citing even a passage or two. But what did survive, apparently, um, is, is again this way of organizing the Christian church into, into different levels. Both sides, there's actually three, um, uh, three groups um, uh, in the church. There's the, the perfect at the top, the upright, um, who are sort of in the middle. And I think both of them are consecrated. There's no mention about a, a, a um, liturgical rite, you know, to, uh, to consecrate them. But there almost had to be the way it's written about. And the third group are just the average Christians who come every Sunday, maybe, and you know, don't, don't get involved too much, but you know, are sometimes extremely good people. Um, someone who's just done a um, uh, wonderful dissertation on this, I think this is particularly uh, um, uh, applicable, is uh, Sister Rosalind Arabaco. Um, mm -hmm. She did her dissertation um, uh, at the Pontifical Oriental Institute in Rome, but she is from uh, Kerala and is, is a nun there now. And uh, um, I, she sent me a copy of her book, and, oh. uh, and I've reviewed it for Hugoye uh, e-journal. And, uh, yeah, she's, she's very uh, – uh, she talks about this a lot, you know, um, you know, about the fact that there are these different levels um, involved. So it's, it's uh, yeah, it, it just, the Book of Steps um, just disappears yeah. in the community. Um, uh, that's not the worst thing in the world. We have the book itself. Yeah. I think in its content, in its, content, uh, it's, it's very much... Uh, close to our heart uh, that as, or maybe just look up, look be, be, I mean, look up tradition, Christian tradition, uh, mm -hmm. way back how they manage their church life and, and how did people involved in their church life is, is, is best explained. And I think that would become a kind of a, a reference point to each one of us, even today in Christianity, how Christianity in general, every period of life, that we had this uh, this various uh, kind of difficulties uh, among the people, and in that way, book of steps and even uh, the the homilies of uh, of of Morphilexinos as discourses is giving us more hope to read uh, in today's world. And with uh, yeah, uh, along with this, I think another major concern that as a theological student and as a researcher would be uh, 
kind of unlike uh, earlier fathers like more afrahat or afram uh, as you referred uh, to uh, about the two books the last two books in the discourse is about fornication uh, gluttony and fornication you just mentioned about the greek influence so unlike yeah. far the more afrahat or more afram Philoxenos of Marburg has been exposed uh, to a far greater influence in the Greek writings and a systematic style of exegesis. Could you explain a bit more about uh, mm -hmm. what was bridging point of these two traditions? Yeah, it's um, and again, this is something that uh, you know I I have some colleagues uh, who, who work a lot on Philoxenos, particularly David Mickelson, who uh, is at uh, Vanderbilt University in Tennessee. He wrote the Christology of Felix Nos Marburg, isn't it? That's correct. Yes, and um, and he and I have worked together on. We did a conference and a couple other uh, things about Philoxenus, but it's. But I think what we're we're generally, uh, you know, it's obvious that he was uh, influenced by their their ideas, and the question still rem remains: Is did Philoxenus know? Greek. Could he read oh, Greek? Okay. Uh, I think most people would still, not, not a lot of people are asking about it, but I think the people that do would say that uh, no, he probably didn't. Uh, but there were translations of these works at a very early, very early age. And so he did pick up on, on some of these. The other, there's two other little things about Philoxenus and his connection to the to the Greek tradition um, is that uh, one is uh, that he was he was very very concerned about the translation of the Peshitta, mm. uh, the, the Syriac New Testament. He actually uh, felt that uh, the Peshitta, in many cases, did not get it right. Mm. And so he, uh, and he writes about it in, in some of his commentaries. He gives some examples. He's never, of course, he's always doing this in Syriac. So you're not, you know, you're you're not quite sure, you know, how deeply he he knows, you know, the Greek side of things. But he's he's quite perceptive. So he um, he commissioned eventually uh, a uh, one of his uh, deacons, uh, Polycarpus. Mm -hmm. in year 507, 508, something like that, uh, published uh, a version, new version of the uh, Peshitta. Uh, and it was later other people would revise it and so forth. Um, so he was, you know, he. the interesting thing that uh, I know Dave Mickelson and others have pointed out is that Philoxenus, as did many of the um, other Syriac authors believed that the Greek New Testament um, is the original. I mean, it is the original, you know, the first time it was written, but that it is still, you know, we, we have to understand what the Greeks were writing about. We have to sort of unravel their language in order to put it into our language. So he felt that the, the Greek New Testament always had precedence over the Syriac, but of course he's in a Syriac world and he wants to make sure people understand what uh, it is all about. Uh, the other thing is just the this odd little thing about his name. Hmm. Uh, there is one text uh, it was found only about 30, 40 years ago um, when he was when he was born, probably uh, in Beth Garmai in, in uh, Iraq. Um, his birth name was apparently Joseph. Hmm. When he became um, a priest, he uh, he took the name of Oxenaya hmm. or Noxenoyo. Um the stranger, hmm. and uh, and of course the stranger is uh, has a number of, of connotations in Syriac uh, 
Christianity, eventually it becomes a, a term for a monk. Mm -hmm. um, but also you are a stranger from this world. You know, in other words, the, the world that's full of all these thoughts and problems and vices, you are, you know, as a Christian, you are a stranger from that. Okay. When he becomes a bishop in 485, he takes the name Philoxenos, hmm. which is just out and out Greek. Yeah. Um, Xenos, of course, Oxenia, it's, it's all related. Um, Xenos means a, a stranger, a foreigner. And philo means lover, lover of strangers. And uh, no one has really kind of delved that much into it, but I think the idea is that it can mean two things. One, uh, the common idiom, a lover of strangers, is someone who is gracious and hospitable, who receives people gracefully. Mm. Um, and uh, But also a lover of strangers means a lover of monks. Yes. Which he should. There's actually no uh, evidence. He's never made a particular in any of his writings that he ever was really a monk. Um, uh, but he obviously respected them and felt that they were uh, those are the people he had to talk to first. Hmm. I think this is another. Uh, great information. At the same time, I think in the Syriac scholarship and also in the Syriac world in the church, uh, we do when when you refer to the Pishito, mm -hmm. I think we have uh, a feel that we we had an earlier versions of uh, Pishito, even yeah. the Af Afrim had his own, you know, compiling of all the four uh, gospels and 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 uh, and uh, definitely uh, as as uh, as a full-fledged book, uh, Felix has had uh, his own uh, his own take on that, and and uh, that that we have uh, we have come across in many scholarships. So, however, he has taken that seriously and put forward the uh, his position to the the translation that he had assigned mm -hmm. uh, to his, uh, his deacon. That is that is another good uh, information that we can. We, I mean, any any theological or maybe biblical student can look into it. Yeah, it's it's still very um, uh, important. He writes. He's done several commentaries, um, Matthew and Luke, um, but it's uh, and and that's where we find the most information about it. Actually, what he does in terms of biblical scholarship is very typical of a lot of Syriac, um, the classical Syriac authors. He does not do as we would have in today's, particularly Western, um, uh, you know, Western biblical studies. Uh, he did not do too much in terms of a of a um, of a commentary. Like here's a verse, and I'll explain what it means, what the background is. You know, uh, uh, no. What he does a lot uh, in his writings is. He's going along talking about some theological point, talking about a spirituality uh, point in, in some of his discourses. And then he tells, uh, retells a biblical story. Mm. And, um, and he has a different spin on it. You know, his story is, um, and sometimes it's meant to sort of prove the right way of the perfect or the upright, uh, but he will he will tell these these longer stories, and um, it's not. And I don't mean this in the in a negative way. It's not a disciplined, um, you know, commentary, word by word, phrase by phrase. He's taking the whole story, and uh, and then trying to, to give it a, a different life and a different direction um, uh, for some of the ideas that he's trying to, um, he's trying to prove and promote at that time. And that's what the Book of Steps, that's what it does. Very few of these 
actually give, uh, you know, a lot of modern writers and preachers and so forth give what we would call proof texts. They'll give a one verse, you know, um, uh, particularly from Paul, um, you know, uh, they'll give a one verse uh, quotation and that proves their point or at least helps them prove their point. Um, a lot of these earlier writers never did that. Afrahat the same way. You know, instead, they would tell the stories. And then what they do along the way is that they pull you, the reader, into the story. And suddenly you find yourself that you're one of the participants. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and then you, you emerge from the story and you look at it, you know, you look at it in a, in a more holistic sense um, than just... Uh, you know, these are the, the the handy little Bible verses that I can use to uh, you know to prove my uh, prove my argument. I think uh, we we have we are coming to the end of this uh, episode. Uh, I think I'd like to just have a, a very important question that is something close to my heart as well. Mm -hmm. In fact, I, when I began my doctoral uh, research. I just wanted to do my studies uh, on Felix Musukma's with a special emphasis on uh, on his uh, a theological book on on Trinity. I think yeah. when I wrote first to you that I, this was our, our topic, and yeah. uh, I, I think fortunately or unfortunately, I couldn't grab one uh, original text at that point in time, and also because of the want of time uh, in my university, I had to literally switch to to front you. Uh, though I had a great passion uh, to do this work, and and it is there always with me, yeah. and therefore I, I just wish to ask you a question: Do you mm -hmm. have any future plan of working on Felixinos? And if so, is there any scope for us to know how you're going to work with on Trinity? Yeah, on the Trinity. Well, that's where uh, one of the places I I want to work on, and I have already started because there's another author I've worked on and that's uh, I um, started to work on him more heavily is Isaac of Antioch yeah. who also does it, uh, poetic um, meme ray um, and I've I'm working with another scholar and we're uh, we're going to be uh, hopefully publishing um, Isaac of Antioch's um, uh, homily on the parrot the par oh. you know the bird that sang the Trisagia Yes, yes. And so the, I, what I'm wanting to look at is uh, how Philoxenus deals with the Trisagion and how that, that is, uh, uh, because he was right at that juncture of time when it, uh, you know, in other words, the, the story of the, uh, you know, the, the so-called story, whether it's absolutely true or not, we don't know, um, about the parrot that... Um, that recited the Trisagion. Uh, this was probably right about the time, exact time that Philoxenus was made the Bishop of Mabuk. Mabuk yeah. And so there's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, I think still work to be done, you know, on that, uh, in that way. A book that I have not read and I, I need to, uh, uh, just, uh, it was just published in the last month um, in Germany is by uh, 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 actually a, a man from uh, Turabdin, um, Musa Akhtas, uh, mm -hmm. who did his uh, doctorate in Germany, and uh, and he did it on Philoxenus of Mabuk, mm -hmm. um, and he focuses on these Trinitarian you know mm -hmm. uh, works. The only bad part about it is, from my point of view, is that it's in German. German. <laughs> Told by uh, I believe uh, uh, Abuna jo uh, across I believe so. Yeah. Uh, I just got the information that uh, someone has already translated this work in Germany, in German. So oh yeah, that is. Yeah. Yeah. And I I've met Musa. He and I have communicated, and then we met last year at a conference and and so forth. But uh, and I I can read German, but it's not the one that I can read very fast. So so I'm but hoping. I to review it and yeah it's it's a good yeah. uh, it's a good work just to see because his he will what i find happens in particularly in in scholarship with things like the book of steps 
Philoxenus, where there is not a lot of scholarship, is that when somebody takes it on to do a dissertation, um, you know, an, an aspect of Philoxenus in this case, they tend to go, well, for one thing, they, they start off by reviewing what everybody else has ever said, you know, mm. about Philoxenus, and then they go a step or two further. And, and that makes it very exciting. Uh, so there, you know, as with much of scholarship, very few of us actually come up with a really good idea. It's usually that we're building on top of what somebody else has researched, somebody else has written about, somebody else has thought about. And then, and then that enables us to be able to, to go one step more. And uh, so I think, you know, Musa's, Musa's book is on my priority list, um, you know, to see where it goes. But I think, yes, the Trisagion is, uh, is a fascinating period uh, uh, because of the conflict that it, uh, that it developed. Um, and, um, yeah, it's worth, it's, and it raises the whole point, particularly with the Syrian Orthodox Church. Uh, in, in fact, that, that made a uh, uh, fascination into me to do my, my research in terms of my uh, idea of connecting these fathers with the Indian context, yeah. especially the context of marginality. So the Trisagon is uh, clearly gives us uh, a theological point of adding Christology in its eminence of God, uh, yes. the crucified Christ, and, and I wanted to take up that particular position of the Syriac Orthodox Church into a conversation with the the social margins in India. No, I think it's uh, it's that's a more than legitimate uh, topic. And it's uh, and, and indeed, I, I have to say uh, say I'm. I mean, I grew up. I didn't realize it until you know until I started studying all this uh, material years ago. You know, I grew up in a Protestant church, which are you know are Chalcedonian. Mm, yes. Within our liberal, uh, what we generally say, liberal uh, Protestant theology, there is definitely a, a leaning towards, um, you know, the idea of Christ as God as suffering. Yeah. Um, yeah. That that makes a lot of sense. I, I I'm not going to go there in terms of. You know whether I, I, I'm I'm going to be a miaphysite, uh, <laughs> but I do find that the ideas that they talk about are particularly valuable for uh, again when we're dealing with social issues and the the oppressed, um, you know, in, in our all of our societies today, yeah. uh, and so it's it it has some real real value in that regard. So, yeah. Yeah. Finally, I ended up with Severus of Antioch and his understanding of Christology, the body of Christ. Yeah. So the mm -hmm. conversation between him and uh, our reputation with the Julian of Halicarnassus. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. so therefore, therefore, I feel, still feel that uh, if you have uh, enough time and, and, uh, and uh, you know, space for taking up on Trinity, uh, probably the other pro next project, maybe after the, the present mm -hmm. ones come, uh, once you you complete the present uh, projects, I believe the own Trinity is uh, is uh, is one of the things that everybody, but particularly yeah. the the young theologians, would like to read it. And uh, probably as as I said at the beginning, uh, sorry, towards the 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 last question, we are we are slowly going to to wind up this session. Yeah. Uh, we are not, we are not going to to end uh, our conversation here, but we will continue to have more. Wise to to the to the world with regard to the Syriac Christianity or probably Syriac literature or Syriac spirituality or fathers anything of that sort. If you have anything, please 
please convey to us. Yeah. Well, I, again, I would. Uh, I is what I've when I was teaching in Soteria. Occasionally, someone would come up to me, and after I'd give a lecture or something of that sort, and they would say, uh, "Gee, you're you're very interested in Syriac. Uh, how come you aren't Orthodox?" <laughs> and I'd say, "Well." Um, I, you know, have my tradition that I grew up in and I still feel comfortable in it. But I said, you know, the Syriac tradition is, is I think, one of the richest and deepest of any Christian uh, theologies. And I've read lots, you know, through my seminary years and, and lots of other places, uh, lots of other authors. Um, and it is, it is, uh, it's phenomenal, and it's and like I say, it is the hidden pearl. It is uh, <laughs> something that you know to a young person who has particularly and who grows up with within families of the Syriac tradition. I'd mm -hmm. say you know you have something that um, is is really one of the the best and most unique in in all of Christianity, and uh, you should take advantage of it partly because the rest of the world needs, needs to hear it. Oh, yes. And uh, the rest of Christianity needs to hear more uh, of what Syriac Christianity is saying. And, um, and it's, uh, so that, that's what you need to do uh, to be able to, uh, to spread this, this joy and this, uh, you know, this, this wonderful gospel. Um, and it's in the language of Jesus. That's always a good. Uh, I mean that. I mean we know that. You know it's hard to 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 be able to say there was very little writing left behind from the first century when Jesus was spoken. But it's uh, it's uh, when Jesus was speaking. But uh, but Syriac's pretty darn close to that. Thank you so much, and uh, thank you so much for spending your time with us. Well, as I said, we, we will look forward to seeing you again uh, with many other topics that you're of your of your interest and also the interest of the uh, scholars who are uh, who are dealing with the Syriac language and literature and also the writings of the early fathers. Yeah. And uh, once again, uh, I know that uh, it's it's uh, it's going to be late night for you. Thank you so much for spending time with us. And also convey our regards to your family, especially your beloved wife. And uh, Orho, the team, will always look forward to uh, to converse with you uh, in future. Oh, and a wonderful, a wonderful platform that you are developing. And and I did see uh, I did see a longtime uh, colleague and friend George Karaz talking a little bit earlier. Um, I know. Uh, and that's that's the way to go. I think it, it's, it's really going to be a good opportunity. I want to thank you for your your thoughts and your questions, uh, both a few years ago. As well. thank, thank you. I do look forward to the future here. Your your name is there in my in the in, in my uh, acknowledgement uh, of my thesis. So, so this is lying in the library. So definitely, I'll send you the copy, and you will be. Uh, I mean, I'm okay. Sure that, Very good. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, and we are signing off. And all Urho, uh, the, the on behalf of the entire uh, crew members, the Urho team, the way we once again thank you. And those who are uh, not part of the Urho, uh, uh, the media, you can sign in, uh, sign in to the Urho team, and we will come up with many other scholars in the in the world, mm -hmm. especially the Syriac scholars. And see you again uh, sometime soon. And thank you, uh, Robert, uh, Reverend Robert uh, A. Kitchen. Big thank you. Tauti, Tauti. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.